and uh, just delighted that you're here. Thank you for coming. I'll say to you what we said last night. We've got a lot of new folks with us tonight. Uh, hey, come back when I'm not here. I know you don't normally do stuff well, probably on Monday night, but they have church services every week here at the Old First United Methodist Church. So if you live in the area you don't have a church home, this would be a great one. And one of the good things about doing events like this where you do a series of meetings is that we meet people from all kinds of congregations. And I think that's a wonderful thing because if you like that, you're going to like heaven. Yeah, because heaven is not composed of Baptist or Methodist or Catholics or Assembly of God. I mean, there, there just aren't any denominations there. We're all one accord. We're all God's family in God's place. So we're going to talk about that tonight. So we're delighted that you're here. Terry, I'm going to throw you a curve. I, I don't normally talk about the books on the second night, but we have a lot of new folks here tonight. So if you got those pictures, and, I, I, and I've, I've got some volunteer people to help me back at the back, so be patient with them because they haven't seen these books before in some cases. Uh, the, the 90 Minutes book is, of course, the one that is biographical. It's really the one I talked about last night. Um, it's the one that's been out for almost 10 years now. It tells the story of what happened. There's a devotional book, uh, 90 stories, one a day for three months. And then there's a book which I will kind of feature tonight, Heaven is Real, Lessons on Earthly Joy for Overcoming Tragedy and Loss and Pain and Difficulty. Um, I, I, I had to learn how, how to do that. I thought I knew, and then I got hit by a truck. And uh, so that book is for folks who are trying to get through something or or know that they will have to try to get through something, based on the premise, if you know where you're going already, shouldn't you be having a better trip on the way? And then the last book is a book I will speak of on Wednesday night called Getting to Heaven. It's the story of what Jesus had to say to his disciples about how to have a meaningful life on the way to heaven. Because all of us, hopefully, are on the way. And if you're not on the way, we want to take care of that tonight. As I said last night, and I mean very sincerely, we're taking reservations tonight. And about six or seven people made reservations last night. Isn't that great? There's some new names written down in glory, and they're probably still singing the names of those people right now in heaven. And our intention is hopefully to see you. It's the same thing happened for you. And you might have just wandered in because somebody told you they had a dead guy down at First Methodist Church, and you want to go see him. And actually, curiosity is a great reason to come to church. I think it is a great reason because you'll get answers to your questions every time you show up here. So uh, I, that's a good reason. But we're going to go a little deeper than that uh, tonight. I'm going to talk about, I'm going to focus tonight on overcoming tragedy and loss and the reality of heaven. Last night, we talked about answered prayer because I was killed in a head-on collision with an 18-wheeler on the way to church one Wednesday morning from a conference in East Texas, on an old bridge over in East Texas, uh, an 18-wheeler crossed the center stripe and hit me head on. I was killed instantly. So if you're wondering if I'm in your dream and you're in mine, no, it really happened. I was really dead. Four paramedics pronounced me dead. I was covered up with a tarp, at least the body was, and they're waiting for a coroner to come and sign the paperwork. Behind me are lots of preachers. They're on their way to church, too. It was a pastor's conference we'd just left, and one of those preachers heard God speak to him and say, pray for the man in the red car. That would have been me. So he was obedient, even though he'd never even remotely entertained the idea of praying for a dead man. It's not part of his theology. I suspect it's probably not part of most of our theologies. We don't really think about praying for people who are dead. Too late. Well, actually, it is too late. But you know what? God's still in the miracle business. So they prayed for me. This guy did. And, and a lot of other people who were notified that I was in a car crash, they prayed for me. They just heard I was in the wreck, not that I was dead. So people all over the world are praying for me. Were at that time, that day, as the body lay there on that bridge. And I was absent from the body and present with the Lord. That's what we're going to speak of tonight. But they're all praying, and God is listening, of course. He hears everything we say, which is really kind of a scary prospect, isn't it? When you think about maybe some stuff you just said today, he hears it all. Well, he's certainly hearing the prayers of these people as they're praying for me. And they prayed for an hour and a half. Well, my wife and my children have been notified that I was in a wreck, but they were not, well, they, they didn't, were able to, uh, to notify them directly. My wife was teaching school, and our children were in school that day, and 
So she just finds out from the principal of the school that I've been in the wreck, and she has to inform our children. And by that time, I'm in transit uh, from well, the wreck site, which was 90 miles away, uh, to the hospital in Houston, the medical center, the level one trauma center that I would be transported to, and a medical center that I would spend 13 months in. So she found out, you know, last year I met four people who prayed for me that afternoon, that morning of January 18th, 1989. For the first time, I met them for the first time. 25 years later, I'm still meeting people who prayed for me that day for the first time. And they're still praying because they know it works. So all these petitions are being left, uh, just li lifted up to the throne of God. Pastor who's praying for my life is in the car with a dead body holding onto my right shoulder. The only thing I didn't break in the accident, my right arm. He's behind me, obviously, uh, under a tarp in the wrecked car with me. And he's praying that God will let me live. And that I won't have any brain damage and eternal injuries. Because he knew the other injuries, you could see them. My, re my right leg was broken at the knee, crushed. My left, when the dashboard collapsed, the left leg was broken just above the knee. I was missing four inches of the femur, the largest bone in the human body. Four inches of my left leg was missing, never found. My left arm was just devastated. The, I put it up when the truck was coming for me. And about, I was driving about 45. He was driving about 65, so you could figure out the impact of the collision. He, the truck took my arm with it into the back seat, and from here forward was lying on the back seat of the car, this part of my arm. They were told I would never walk again. If I lived, uh, I would have brain damage and internal injuries. If they were able to reattach this arm, it would just hang by my side for the rest of my life. So they're all praying, and they prayed an hour and a half. How do we know this? The accident happened at 1145 on that bridge just before lunch. It's now 1.15 in the afternoon. People are praying all over the world. One man is praying over the body in the wrecked car. He's been praying and singing hymns for 90 minutes. He's singing the old hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. A guy named Scriven, George Scriven, he, uh, he was an Irishman. He uh, was engaged to be married, fallen in love, deeply in love with this young lady, and they were going to meet by the river to have a picnic on the day before they were to be married. On the way there, she was thrown from her horse and killed. He was so heartbroken and devastated, he vowed never to get married. He just didn't think he could love anyone else like that again. Years did pass, and he did fall in love again. With a young lady, before they were able to be married, she developed scarlet fever and died. He left Ireland. He just left Ireland and, and all the heartbreak associated with it. He moved to Canada, spent the rest of his life as a pastor, as a, as a person who, do, who did good deeds for other people. He would chop wood for widows and carry water for people. He just, everything he found to do that would bless God, that's what he did. One day he received word from Ireland that his mother was very near death. Knowing that he might not be able to get to her before she passed away, he did sit down to write her a poem. And those are the words of what a friend we have in Jesus. Set to music later. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. He's singing that song, Dick Honorecker is, the pastor over my dead body, 90 minutes after the truck hit me, and suddenly, without any warning, under that tarp, in the dark, as he sang that song, I started singing it with him. Yeah. And he exited the car briskly. <laughs> yeah. Some of us would have gotten out of the car a little faster than others, but I think we all would have gotten out of the car. But I doubt, seriously, if anybody would have done this, this preacher walked over to the rail, really ran over to the policeman, who he'd kind of pleaded with to get in the car and said, Officer, the dead man is singing. And uh, nobody believed that. They did get me out of the car with great difficulty. I was taken to several hospitals because they were not capable of dealing with my kind of catastrophic injuries. I did wind up 
in Houston that evening. Well, the ice didn't have 1145. I arrived in Houston at Memorial Hermann Hospital at 615 that night, and I would be in a hospital bed for 13 months. So last night we talked about answered prayer. I believe I'm here because a lot of people prayed and God said yes. I'm really, really, uh, really had very, I had nothing to do with my survival, really. I, 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 would have, I would have stayed there had I had a chance, not come back here. This is a lovely place, you're lovely people, but you, if you've been there, you do not want to be here. So I was there having the best time, and we'll, we'll wind up there in just a few minutes. And, and uh, so I was prayed back, and God said yes to the prayers of the people. You know, over in the little book of James, uh, in, John, in James chapter 5, it's, it's a short book, James is, but it's got lots of good stuff in it. And then it starts, James chapter 5, with a question that, of relevance for everybody who thinks the Bible may be old and irrelevant. It doesn't matter anymore. If you don't think it matters anymore, how about this question in the Bible? Is any one of you in trouble? That's what it says. That's the question that starts James chapter 5. Well, the answer is right after it is, then he should pray. Yeah, it starts with prayer. And so they were in trouble. I, I didn't figure I was in trouble very much. I was in heaven. I was having a great time. But they prayed me back, and then I was in trouble for a long, 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 long time. But I, I, you know, God had a plan. He always does. So they're praying, and I'm here. I believe in prayer. I believe in miracles. I told you I had brain damage and internal injuries, and I, you know, one of my legs was lost, and the other one was crushed, and this arm was in the back seat, and I was impaled on the steering wheel. So any one of those injuries could have been catastrophic. With the kind of open, gaping wounds that I had, anyone would have bled to death in five minutes or less. speaking, I was signing books like I will after we finish tonight. And this young girl came up. She was about 12. She took my hand and she said, Mr. Piper, something bad happened to you. She was living in a foster home. Her foster parents were sitting right beside her. I looked up at them, shook my head, and they looked down at me. They shook their heads at me. And I said, honey, this is the first day of the rest of your life. Because tonight, beginning tonight, we're going to get you some help. 
you know, and you're some of the better than that old. See, she needed a miracle, and she found it in the church. I believe God's doing some of this best stuff now. You may have wandered into the old First United Methodist Church tonight and need a miracle. I'm very excited to tell you that God is still in the miracle business. I see it all the time. I hold the hands of miracles all the time. Maybe you do. So I am one. I know. I had so many close brushes with death, double pneumonia after the accident, infections that almost took my life on several occasions, a while in isolation, unable to even see any other human beings. They just came in through two or three doors and covered in all sorts of things from head to toe. It was just a long, dark night. Told I would never walk again. I walked in here tonight. And when I'm finished, I'm walking out. So I believe in miracles. But I have to tell you, I had a tough time getting through this. You know, if you read the book, you know that. I mean, it was, it was a long, dark night, really. Terry, you, you want to put that, that side view thing that we showed last night of, um, of me in the hospital? While, while we're doing that, let me ask you a question. Anybody been to a wedding recently? What, what? I know they get married in Louisiana. I got married in <laughs> 40 years ago. Got married at Mark Style Baptist Church in Boger City, Louisiana. Well, let's imagine we're in a wedding right now. You know how this happens. The pastor or whoever's conducting the wedding will come and stand here in the middle. And, and he or she will look very dignified, but we know them and we know they're not. Then usually, uh, frequently off to the side, the groom and the groomettes will come in and they'll stand over here. And they'll face out. They'll look very dignified, but we know they're not. <laughs> okay? Then there'll be some special music and some very attractive young ladies will walk down the aisle carrying flowers and wearing dresses they'll never wear again and they'll stand over here facing out. Then there'll be some very special music and the door will open at the back and frequently on the arm of her father will be Brian. Brian. Now you can tell the difference between Brian and groom at the wedding other than just the way they're dressed. When the groom walks in, people lean over and say, is that him? <laughs> and what happens when Brian walks in? People stand up, they turn around, they come for miles to see her dress. That's why her here. Her dress. <laughs> that's what she wants them to see. And so here she comes down the aisle. You know, I was in the hospital for so long and I was told I would never walk again. I got to tell you, one of the highlights of my life was when I walked my daughter down the aisle. And she turned to me that day and said, Daddy, I sure am glad you're here. As if I needed a reason to be more emotional. You <laughs> gave it to me. Well, with that in mind, I want you to listen to some verses of Scripture from Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. Anytime the Bible talks about there being no sea, it means nothing separates us anymore. Because in those days, if you were separated by a sea, it was going to take some doing to get to those people. I mean, you remember when Jesus was crucified and, and Simon of Cyrene carried the cross for Jesus. That's where, that's where Olivia is today. So the only way Simon could get to Jerusalem to be there for the, the Passover and, and Pentecost and all those things that followed is that he had to get on a boat run by the Phoenicians and get over there. So it, it was a long time. We're talking about weeks to cross oceans to get to places. So when the Bible says there's no longer any sea in heaven, it means that we're all together, nothing separates. Same place, same time, God's people. I saw the holy city New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. Now, the Bible always talks about heaven in concrete terms. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. He chose the word place because it's a place. 
he, he said it had rooms or mansions, okay? Elsewhere in the Bible, it's called a kingdom. Right here in Revelation, it's referred to as a, as a city. It's a city, just like this one. It's a city. It's, it's got barriers, boundaries, limits. It's a city. It's got a wall around it. It's a very thick wall, and it's a high wall, but it says in the Bible, the gates are never closed. Isn't that great? That's great. So it's a city. So that's kind of the, the picture of heaven. But now listen to what it says next. This beautiful city, this heavenly city, is prepared for a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. Did you ever read that? I, I confess I read that before I got run over by the truck, but I, I, I must have not paid much attention to it. Because after I got hit and hurt so badly, I had a lot of time to read the Bible. And suddenly one day I'm reading that scripture about heaven being prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for a husband. Because you know, the church is the bride of Christ. We, we, as the body of believers, whatever church, we're the church, we're the body of believers, we are the bride of Christ. So it's like Christ looking for his church. But it's also like a husband looking at his wife. Now everybody's looking at the bride, that's the whole point of the ceremony. But nobody is looking at her like him. This is his bride. This is a lifetime commitment. This is an awesome day for them both, but, but no less for him. Forty years ago, I can still remember, I can close my eyes and remember seeing her come through that door. Forty years, three children, two grandchildren ago. I'll never forget. I was very excited. But I couldn't have known what the years were perfect. Let me ask you a question. How would you live your life if you thought of heaven like that? Like a groom standing here looking at a bride. You thought of the church like that. You were excited. You were anticipating. You were very excited. Let me suggest we don't think about heaven at all until instead of having a wedding here at the old church, there's a body up here in a casket and we're having a funeral. Then we think about heaven. Because we're confronted with our own mortality. We're looking at this body and we're thinking, you know, they're going to take her out to the cemetery a little bit and bury her. It's going to happen to me one of these days. You bet. Death rate here is 100%. Not getting none of this. A lot. you got one option to survive death. Jesus returns while you're alive. That's it. So we don't think about it that way. And I want to suggest that we all start thinking about heaven that way. We ought to get excited about the prospect of heaven because we'd live different lives if we did and we'd be a lot more interested in getting other people in if we did. Well, I had plenty of time to think about it. I was in a hospital bed for a long time. I had to put my leg back on the device that had never been used before. I told the folks last night they took the skin off my right leg. You could see where it was broken at the knee. This was a long time afterwards. It's been healing for quite a while because they had a cast on it. They took the skin off my right leg and put it on my right arm. If you like that other picture, Terry, you can kind of see. It's not a great picture, but you can kind of see on the side of the picture where they put my arm back on in the profile picture uh, with a, a device that held it in place with a bar on top of it, a bar below it, and rods going through me and out the other side. All that skin there where that that injury was where it was severed, it came from that leg on the next one. They moved it from here up here. All the bones in this arm came from the hip. They harvested them from my pelvis and they put them up here. I told the folks last night, medical people have a wonderful knack for finding things you didn't even hurt. Hurt that for you to fix the other <laughs> So I lay there in a hospital bed like, like this for 13 months. And it was a long, dark night. I mean, they told me that this might not work, and I got infections that almost claimed my life, as I said. And, and, and even when they took it off, I had to learn to walk again just like a child. I, mean, I had to literally learn to stand up and walk. I spent months in a pool, a, a, a swimming pool or a therapeutic pool, because I couldn't do weight-bearing on, on the leg. I had to, it was just a long, dark night. But while this is going on, 
I'm in St. Luke's Hospital in Houston, Medical Center, right across the street from MD Anderson Hospital. I can look out my window on the 21st floor, that's what this room is, 2115, and I can look across the street at the top of MD Anderson. I knew all those cancer people were over there because I had visited many times as a pastor. Now remember, I'm a pastor. Here I am. I'm the victim. I'm not visiting people. I am the victim. And people were nice to me. My church members came to see me. Family members came to see me. All kinds of people came to see me. And they were very, very kind. Very, very thoughtful. But you know who I wanted to see in this situation? I wanted to talk to somebody who had this happen to them before. So I could talk to them about how you get over it. There were, any. There were no other people who had this on. No one. None. No one. And so, in spite of all the encouragement I received and all the nice words I received, I wanted to talk to somebody who got it, who understood it. But there wasn't a solitary person. So one morning at 3 a.m., I found myself in that bed, shaking my fist at God. He said, really? You were, you were a pastor and you were shaking your fist at God? Sure. God would really be angry and then ignore it. And I wasn't really so angry about what happened. It was an accident. This guy wasn't trying to hurt me that day. What I was angry about is that I was so isolated and alone. I'd seen heaven and had it taken away from me. And now I'm in this shape. And I can't find anybody who understands what this is like or has endured it so I can see what the results are going to be. I am the guinea pig. I am the person who's trying it out. And so I'm shaking my fist at God. I don't understand why you can't send someone here who understands what this is like. Can't you send somebody here who can help me get through it? I'm listening to some music beside the bed. Over there on the other side of that bed is a little shelf, and I had a music uh, machine, a music that was actually a cassette machine in those days. So I'm listening to some music I was very familiar with. Wow, we had great music. And I asked that, excellent music. So I'm listening to two songs that have been out for quite some time. One of them is uh, by a group called uh, The Imperials. It's called uh, Praise the Lord. And it, it kind of goes something like this. When you're up against a struggle and you don't think you can hold on, praise the Lord. Now, does that sound like faulty theology or what? <laughs> hey, things are really terrible down here, God. Thanks a lot. <laughs> That's what it sounds like. Praise the Lord for the bad thing. But it goes on, you have to listen to the whole thing. It says, when you praise God, praise the Lord, for the things that seem to bind you, then they fall kind of helpless and they're silent behind you. Wow, I wanted the chains off. And God said, you need to praise me for whatever circumstances you find yourself in. I'm going to use that to bless other people. And I was just digesting that. And the next same song came on. It was by a friend of mine. And incidentally, Three of the remaining living imperials have called me to tell me how much they appreciate me writing that in that book. And, and, and then the next song was by, by a friend of mine from Houston. His, his name is David Meese. And he wrote a song called We Are the Reason. A very popular song a few years ago. He says, I finally found the reason for living. Well, that's what I was looking for. Because I was never going to be like I was before. I finally found a reason for living. And the words are, it's in giving every part of your life. And all that you do and all that you say, I'm just going to be giving it all to him. Even the really bad parts. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, I, I've never been a particularly outwardly emotional person, but I dissolved into tears at that moment with that message. Because God said to me, this is not about you about what I can do now through you that I can never do before the church. You're going to be able to hold people's hands and say, I understand how you feel. Wow. Yeah. That's exactly what happened. He said, you need to take the test and make a testimony that's going to bless other people. Take the mess you're in and make a message that will be meaningful to other people. Take the disappointments that you're facing find divine appointments to help other people. That's what I've been doing ever since. You know what? <coughs> you can do that. Lost your husband. Lost your job. So 
somebody did something to you. You can shake your fist at God all day long. It won't bother him a bit. Or you can take the same hand, put your arm around someone else and say, let me help you. I've, I've been where you are. Together, we can get to it. See the difference? Here's the difference. Bitter, better. See, if that doesn't mean anything to you right now, if you live long enough, it will. I promise you. I was at Walter Reed Hospital. Among the rooms I went into was a young soldier who was driving a Humvee <coughs> with two or three other soldiers in it. Came under enemy fire. lying there in the bed. A rocket apparently had gone through the big vehicle and emerged on the other side. But when it did, he took his right foot with it. He was the driver of the company. It means he no longer has a foot to put on the accelerator to make the machine go. They're sitting ducks. These people were firing him. This young man had the presence of mind to take his hands and pick up his remaining leg put it on the gas pedal to get that machine out of the way and save the lives of all the people. My privilege to stand there as he had a purple heart pinned on him. I'm sure there were other metals stunning and he certainly deserved it. But I held his hand and I said, I want you to know that a great formation is thankful for your sacrifice. And I couldn't be more proud of you. I was born in an army hospital. It is my privilege to stand there. Sir, I honor you, dear sir. I must tell you, things are never going to be the same. But you don't have to be better. You can be better. I believe God can use you in ways that He never could have done. Here's my card. If you ever want to talk to somebody about it, it would be my privilege to hear whatever's on your mind. If you just want to wave and carry on, that's all right. I know. We all need somebody who gets it. Somebody. You can do that person. God help you do that person. I call that finding a new norm. I would never be the person I was before, but I didn't have to be defeated by it. I have been knocked down, but I have not been knocked out. So I want to suggest to you that you can overcome. And that God, instead of being angry at him for taking your daughter or your son or whoever he lost, that if they knew the Lord, they're with him anyway. And he's taking good care of them, better than we could down here. And the separation is real, but it won't last. He knows what he's doing. You can certainly help someone else get through it. It's difficult as it was for you to get through it. God help you to do that. I, I, I really believe that. I, I really believe that we have to overcome that. Because I did. I, I was not prepared for that. I really don't know really how anybody could be prepared for something like that. Especially something that no one had ever had before. And I had to, I had to really kind of find a way to, to get over it. And, and I did. I uh, was speaking at a church north of Houston called Fellowship of the Woodlands. It's a big church. They have 26,000 members and they have six services on Saturday and Sunday. Can you imagine that? I didn't until I got there. And I said, how many? <laughs> how many times I want to preach? Six? Okay. So I'm preaching in these services, and I, in between, I, I sign books, believe it or not. So it's not just six services, it's six books, signings, and six services. So I'm sitting on a stool at a table, and I'm signing books. And there are lots of people in line to get a book signed. They're very loud. This is outside of me in the foyer. And I'm signing books, and they're very loud. I get over here myself. I think they're taught. And I know i got two or three more sermons to do. And I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden, all these loud people got very quiet. And I'm in a roped-off area. I mean, a roped-off area. And, and I didn't know what was going on. And as I looked up from the book I was signing, and all these people that are standing in line are looking around me. Like this. So I knew something was going on behind me. And there was this roped-off area. Nobody was supposed to be back there, but there was. 17-year-old Travis is back there. Travis is 
walking towards me with great difficulty. He's got an entourage behind him. He's got parents, sisters, aunts, uncles. They're all behind him. And he's moving towards me, but very, very slowly because Travis is wearing that. And he's dragging it behind him. I got off my stool. I excused myself, and I start walking towards Travis. Travis took a couple more steps, and then... But I don't know to this day whether Travis wanted to hug me or he just fell on top of me and grabbed me for support. And he puts his arms around me, high school athlete, very strong in the man, and he says to me, I read your book, and I heard you were going to be here. I had to come and talk to you. I've got to find somebody who understands. I said, you found me. And we did. About two hours that day, then I went to spend the whole day at his house and about two weeks later. He got to talk with all his family because they needed some encouragement too. They were trying to take care of Travis and they didn't know what to do. They were at a loss. That's why I always say my wife is the hero of the story. I survived the accident. She overcame the accident. That's why, you know, we have her new book with us. But I just got here. She's the one who got us through. Well, Travis needed somebody to help him understand. And they did too. You know, I, I don't think Travis will ever be a high school baseball pitcher again. I, I don't probably not. But I do know this: Travis is uniquely prepared to help people through really dark times in their life as he's been. Some of you have some work for me. I suggest an audience this size. Some of you need to get over bitter and start being better. I think you know who you are. If you don't hear anything else tonight, I, I hope you heard that. And I hope you don't have to get in my truck to figure that out. It's a high price. This is so important. I put the scriptures here in this book. That I felt would be helpful to other people. Second Corinthians 1, 3, and 4. Listen, based on what we just talked about. All praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the source of every mercy and the God who comforts us. He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. When others are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. When I was struck by the truck, I found myself in heaven. And here's what I found. It's the continuation of Revelation 21. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them, and they will be with him and be his people. Now, if you want to know the best thing about heaven, in heaven you are with God. We're not singing about God. We're not thinking about God. We're not hoping God shows up. It's his place. We are with God. So that's the best thing about heaven. You are with God and it lasts forever. You are in the presence of the great God of all creation. The one who created you. You're right there with him. But there's other good stuff. That's not it. That's just not all of it. There's more. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. I probably cried more tears during this experience than I ever thought was possible. Not just pain, heartbreak, loneliness, isolation suffering. There will be no more death in heaven. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of funerals, aren't you? I, I'm in the past two years, I have buried my mother-in-law, my father, and my best friend. I'm tired of funerals. Last night I told you about my dad, veteran of World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. Highly decorated Master Sergeant in the U.S. Army. Couldn't be prouder of him than I, I tried. I remember that funeral at Hillcrest Cemetery in Bozier. It was 
soldiers drove up in Fort Polk. Carried them. My deep honor to conduct this funeral. I don't think I could have done it had he not asked me to do it himself. And I was a soldier's son, so I did not. I saw the flash of the 21 guns. I heard the taps play. And I watched another sergeant follow the flag from his castle, as I had seen him supervise many times himself. That soldier took that flag to my mother, my father's life of 61 years, and said a grateful nation. Just thank you for your son. I miss my dad. But I know where he is. He's having the best time. No emphysema, no heart trouble, no Agent Orange, no malaria, maybe no medals, but I know he's happy to be I miss him. The Bible says there is, there is no death in heaven. No death. You can count on it. You live long enough here, we're always saying goodbye to friends. There are no goodbyes in heaven, only hellos. No one ever leaves. Last forever. Oh, there's more good stuff. That's not the end of it. It says there's no mourning. And oh, wow, how much time do we spend here in mourning? Sometimes it lasts the rest of our life. Or crying. And here's one of my favorites. Or pain. You can take that down, Terry. I think we've looked at it enough. <laughs> there's no pain. Now, I'm talking about all the kind of pains you can feel. I mean, we know that there's a lot more than physical pain. In fact, the pain that's not physical can sometimes be the most devastating of all. I mentioned last night when I got to heaven and Jesus is there, in heaven there are no scars except His. Jesus is the only person in heaven with scars. And He'll retain them so we'll be reminded of how we got there. But you won't have any on you. You know, the ones you got in elementary school and somebody trips you and you broke your arm? Happened to me. You know that scar when my brother hit me with a brick? <laughs> Don't laugh, you know. Brothers do that. Sister and sisters do too, sometimes too. But there won't be any scars in there. No scars. You won't have a scar on you either. Only one is Jesus. No pain! There's a place where there's no pain. You'll never suffer pain at all. So here I am arriving at the gates, and I'm standing in front of my grandfather. I talked about him last night. My grandfather was very dear to me. My grandfather was a carpenter. He was uh, illiterate. Born before the Depression, he was a lumberjack during the Depression for a dollar a day in Arkansas. He grabbed a train with a bunch of other men in the morning and worked all day come back that evening, he owned one shirt and one pair of socks with his name. My grandmother washed them when he got home, so he had them the next day. The men noticed that he had the same pair of socks on every day. They were tickled by that, even though they were poor too. And they started calling him Joe Socks. He died with that day. He liked it. It reminded him of where he cut. Joe Sox. Joe Sox met me at the gate. Uh, I've been with him when he died. I rode in the ambulance when he died. I, I was devastated by his death, sudden death, heart attack one night. And last time I'd seen him, it was at a casket. Now I'm standing at the gates of heaven. I'm surrounded by people just like him. People who preceded me in death and now are there forever having the best time. They knew I was coming. You will not sneak up on heaven. Everybody in heaven knows who's coming. The Bible says anytime someone decides to go there by accepting Christ as Savior, they have a celebration up there for you. Announcing that you're coming. There is a registration book. It won't surprise you. At 3,000 speaking engagements in the past nine years, I've registered at a lot of hotels. There have been times, though, when I showed up late and maybe they gave my room to someone else. That was not a good feeling. Because my name was on the register. That'll never happen to him. 
They have a registry up there called the Lamb's Book of Life. Your name will be on that book if you have an authentic personal relationship with Jesus. They're expecting you. So you're not going to sneak up. I was greeted by people who were waiting for me. They were expecting me. So Papa was there, extended his hands, and said something in the language I've never heard before but fully understood. As he said, welcome home, darling. I told the people last night, you go get the Leesville yearbook from Leesville Elementary School in 1956. You'll see my picture in there. I'm wearing a feed sack shirt that my mother made out of a feed sack and suspenders. And under me it says, Donnie Black. My grandfather extended his hands to me at the gates of heaven and said, welcome home, Donnie. He's the only one ever called me that. He was missing fingers here on earth, three on one hand, two and a half on a other. A lot of hard jobs will do that to you. But his hands were complete when I saw him. He was perfect. Just perfect. Very much unlike what I saw him there in that casket in Bossier City, Louisiana, where we had his room. He's buried just a few yards from my dad. My dad's in the military section. Papa, during the Depression, during World War II, Worked in Orange, Texas, for the destroyers of the U.S. Navy. He didn't go out to sea, but he made ships so that they could. This is a I know where My great grandmother was standing right beside Papa. She was a victim of osteoporosis here on Earth. Her name was Hattie. Hattie Mann, M A N N. You'll never know how excited we were as junior high boys to go to school and tell everybody that our great grandmother was a man. <laughs> He was, Hattie Man. <laughs> well, Hattie was standing there too. Here on earth she was she was, had osteoporosis. I never saw her in my whole life walk any other way but like this. She couldn't stand up straight, her bones had collapsed. So when she was looking at you, she was looking up, actually. She was so far tilted over. And she wasn't missing fingers like Papa. She was missing teeth. She didn't have any teeth. Well, a lot of people born in the 1800s didn't have dental hygiene like we do today, so she had a set of dentures, false teeth. She did not like them. She only wore them once a week <laughs> to church on Sunday. <laughs> when she got home from church on Sunday, she would take her false teeth out and put them in a glass of water beside the sink in the kitchen. Some of you know what I'm talking about. When we were little boys, we didn't have anything to do. <laughs> Sometimes we just sneak in the kitchen and stare at Grandma's teeth. <laughs> they were always smiling back at us. <laughs> My great grandmother Hattie met me at the gates of heaven. She was standing beside Papa. This was her son. -in -law. And she was standing upright. I never saw her stand like that before. If you hear her, she was not even five feet tall. But now she was about five feet six because she was standing upright. And I just kind of had gotten over that when she smiled at me. <laughs> I'd never seen her real smile before. Honestly, I thought she was pretty when she was here. But in heaven, she was perfect. And so shall we be. Really. I was greeted by all these people I had known and loved in life. Over here were a couple of friends from high school. I graduated from Bossier High School in 1968. It was a great year, except for a couple of things. We played for the state championship in basketball. We almost made the district championship. We had great teams. Two of those boys died. Barry and Mike. Mike died after he finished school and graduated. I told you about it last night. They were there to meet me at the gates of heaven, standing over here. There were teachers and aunts and uncles and people of all kinds of descriptions, various backgrounds. I, I, I knew that they did not know each other, most of them here on earth, but it was interesting that they greeted me. I knew them. I did not see anybody I did not know here on earth. I was greeted by people who I, I knew. Now, I know there are a lot of people inside that I never met, but you know what? I'll know them too. You don't, you don't have to be introduced to anybody with them. You just know them. They'll know you. They're expecting you. So I'm surrounded by these people. Over here is my next door neighbor, Mrs. Norris. Mrs. Norris 
lived next door to me when we were living outside Shreveport in a place now where the General Motors plant stands. They had to tear down that house and build the General Motors plant. My dad got called away, I think, to Korea that time. Well, you couldn't go with your dad to Korea. So we were home again. We we're alone again. My mother, my brothers, my poor mother. She raised the three of us just about by herself. Well, she did a good job, I think. So we're out there, and mother's by herself, and, and we're going to have to move a little closer to my grandparents so we can have somebody look after us. And, and I, I'm lonely. My grandmother would take us to church when I lived next door to her, or near her, and we lived behind her, actually. But, but I mean, when we lived out there in the country, there was no way to go to church. I, I, I went to school on a school bus every day, but my mother didn't have a driver's license. And so there was no way we could go anywhere except for the kindness of strangers. Miss Norris lived next door. She and her husband were foster parents. They had a whole house full of kids. The characters were always changing, but they were taking good care of those kids. Always did. Had a couple of children of their own, too. Well, she lived there. She, my mother would talk over the back fence. One day, she said to my mother, Do you think Donnie wants to go to church? I don't remember. I said, yes, 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 I would like to go to church. And my mother said, well, okay, if you don't mind taking him. Oh, no, I'd love to take him. Just get in, just tell him to get dressed and stand by the mailbox the next Sunday morning. Wow, I didn't have to be asked twice. Next Sunday morning, I set the alarm, I got up and got dressed, and I went out and stood by the mailbox on the, on the road in front of our house. And I waited, 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 here came the station wagon. Fully kids, you could hear them coming down the road. And it pulled right up in front of my house, and Miss Norris rolled down the window, and she looked down at me, glasses out to here, and a smile about as big, and she said, Honey, would you like to go to the Lord's house today? And I said, Yes, ma'am. I surely would. And she said, Boys and girls, move over. Donnie's, Donnie's coming to church with us. And I would climb into that old station wagon every Sunday morning with those kids. And I knew. So I didn't care about it. Miss Norris, whom I had never even thought of in 20 years. That being the case of that. And she deserved to be there because she helped me get there. And in fact, everybody did. Mike had a profound impact on my spiritual life. He'd been a member of church all of his life that I was invited to later on. And, and I went to that church and, and I, I got to know him and I got to know the other guys in the class. And, they were very encouraging to me. And in one Sunday morning, in a, in a church just like this, sitting on the third row, like right over here, the pastor said, who wants to go to, the, who wants to, go to heaven? We're taking reservations this morning. Who wants to go to heaven? And I was sitting right there. And when they started playing some music, I left my seat and I came down and took the pastor's hand and I said, I want to go to heaven. He said, son, this is the best decision you'll ever make. I didn't know on the lonely highway in East Texas, 22 years later, I was going to get run over by a truck and killed. But thank God, that's right. So here's what I found amongst the people who greeted me at the gates of heaven. Number one, they were all ready. My great grandmother had the stroke at 76. She wasn't planning to die. Mike was run over by a truck at 18 and killed. He wasn't planning to die. Then. But everybody there had given their hearts to Christ. So, Tonight is your night. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. And it means that because today is the only one we got. The guarantees of tomorrow, there's not a thing we can do about yesterday. But today, we can take reservations. The other thing they had in common is they all helped me get there. Of course, I left heaven and came back here, not because I wanted to. But I came back here fully aware of the fact that I was greeted at the gates of heaven by people who helped me get there. And here, the question, I lay there in that bed and contemplated what there. If we greet people at the gates of heaven, then we help get there. Then, Don, who are you going to greet? And I'm asking you tonight. Who will you greet at the gates of heaven? Who goes to your school? Who lives on your road? Who are you related to? Who are your friends? Who do you work with that you hope to see in heaven someday, but you're not sure they're going to work? I was greeted by the people who took me to church. 
people who told me about Jesus, the people who lived consistently Christian lives in front of me, so I knew how to be one. Those people. So I want to suggest that's why we're all still here. To help people get there. Otherwise, we would go to heaven the moment we became Christian. We have something to do. You do. I'll be praying for you. Maybe tonight, before you leave this room, you just need to commit yourself to saying, I need to, I need to witness. I need to bring her to church. I need to invite her. That guy, I've, I've known him and cared about him for years, but the truth is, I'm not sure he knows anything about Christ. And I want to, God help me help them know you. And he will. He'll meet them at the gates. Isn't that awesome? What a happy prospect. I told you there was a gate. There are 12 of them. They're early gates. Dazzlingly early gates. Further on in Revelation 21, you'll see that there are, is not a sun or a moon in heaven. They don't need either one. God illuminates heaven with His majesty and glory. In heaven, the moon even is gone. There's no use. Jesus in heaven is called the Lamb of God. It's in Revelation 21. You can look on the next page. He is the lamp of God. And so you will be basking in the glow of God Almighty. Jesus, the Son of God. You'll be surrounded by that light. You'll be blinded by the light if you were looking with your earthly eyes, but you won't have earthly eyes there. So I'm looking at this gate that's pulsating with life. And I want to part these people who come to greet me because I know they're coming in after me. They live there. And I'm moving forward through layers of aroma unlike anything I've ever smelled here. Just incredibly incredibly powerful smells and glorious smells. And then I'm going through angels. They're everywhere. We don't become angels in heaven. But they're there to greet us. In fact, they're the ones who bear us up. And I can not only hear their voices, I can hear their wings. I never expected to hear their wings. You go into the woods out here, the piney woods, and, and you flush out a covey of birds and you can hear their wings. There's only wings that make that sound. You can hear it all over heaven. Not all angels have wings, but you can hear the ones who do. What a comforting sound it is. Then I moved through the angels to the music. The music in heaven was awesome. All songs glorifying God, for He alone is worthy of our praise. Glory to God they were singing. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Worthy is the Lamb. Thousands of songs at the same time without chaos. But one song was soaring all over all of them. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Because He is holy. And we're not. So how did I get it? Because I'm sure you're not holy. I got witnesses. I gave my heart to Jesus when I was 16. He made me holy. In the sight of God. What can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. See, I could be in a holy place with a holy God. Because I was made holy by what Christ did for me on the cross. And you, on the cross. Jeremy 7. Gift is not a gift if you don't take it. I'm going in now surrounded by the music. You know, I was thinking. After I got out of LSU, I went to Shreveport and worked for a telephone radio station called KWKH. And I worked there for a few years with uh, Jim Hawthorne, uh, who was called James Lynn in those days. And then I worked, worked for Channel 12 in Shreveport. I worked there for a living. I'm thinking about the music we used to play. One of the things you never do on the radio is play two songs at the same time. You'll get calls. But in heaven, I heard thousands of songs. No chaos. They all fit together. Here in the first United Methodist Church in Leesville, I can still hear those songs. I want you to hear them. God wants you to hear them. But heaven is a prepared place for prepared. I'm going in the gates now. I can see the street down the center of the city made of gold. God can make his streets out of whatever he wants. Gold is the choice. On both sides, magnificent structures. My father's house are many mansions and rooms are like me. In the center of the city, high and lifted up, a pinnacle, the brightest light I have ever seen, even compared to the ones at the gates. 
it's the thrones that are high and lifted up. I knew that. This was his city. And I just wanted to pass these people. I wanted to go through that very thick gate. I wanted to go down that street of gold, transparent, and, and climb that hill and just fall at his feet and just say thank you for letting me come. But I never got a chance. I, I have people behind me who greeted me. I have the angels around me. I'm going through the gates and I'm emerging inside the great city of God. When it all stopped. I found myself in silence and darkness. And the first thing I wanted to do was cry out, what's going on? I just arrived. What's happening? Before I could even say that, I heard a voice. And this time, it's not in front of me like all the other things in heaven. It's behind me. It's that preacher in that car singing that song, whatever it is. About to live a very uncertain future. Do something. Every day in that bed, I would look up into heaven and say the same thing. Why did you let me see that and take it away from me? Why did you let me see that and bring me back to this? And the answer I have tonight is this. So I can be in this room. Take it to your face. Heaven is real. And Jesus is the one. No pain, no dying, no mourning, no death. You'll be with God forever. The people who preceded you and those who went there. What a glorious prospect this is. Now, men, don't leave here without this. Ladies, this is for you. Young people, tonight's the night. I was 16 years old when I made that decision. Don't miss this chance. way you can stand in front of a holy God is to ask God to forgive you of your sins. That's what Jesus did when he died on the cross. He took them away. Him. gave an invitation in a church in Hawaii. Fan-shaped auditorium. Holy Spirit moved in a radical way. Lots of people are coming forward. Over here against the wall, a lady is coming down the aisle to give her heart to Jesus, but she's in a wheelchair. And she's making very little progress because she's very old. She's barely making that wheelchair go. Well, I lived in a wheelchair for a couple of years. I know what that's like. So I was about to leave here and go over and help her get down the aisle of the wheelchair. And some man saw her and helped her get all the way down to the front. One of the counselors went over and talked to her, just like they were to several people who made decisions that night. And I thought to myself while standing over here, that must be some kind of conversation. She looks really old. After the service was over with, they waved me over to see her because I wanted to meet her. And I walked over there to where she was in her wheelchair. <laughs> I looked down at her and I said, I took her little hand, it was very wrinkled. I said to her hand, I said, ma'am, I saw you coming down tonight. Did you make a decision? She said, I sure did. I said, what is your decision? She said, tonight I gave my heart to Jesus. I said, well, hallelujah. You know, the angels are singing your name right now announcing that you're coming someday. And she smiled at me and she says, I don't think it's going to be too long before I get there. <laughs> I said, you don't mind my asking, how, how old are you? She said, 95. I said, you're 95 years old and you gave your heart to Jesus? She said, yeah, isn't God good? He doesn't get up long enough to do this. I said, yes, ma'am, God is good all the time. There's one thing you should know, she said. I said, what's that? She said, Piper, this is the first time I've ever been in a Christian church in my life. Let me say this to you. If a 95-year-old woman can roll herself down the aisle of a wheelchair and give her heart to Jesus, just come by faith. You don't understand it all. If you only did stuff you understood, you wouldn't pull me. So just come by faith. That's all you need. Heaven is real. Pray with me. Lord, thank you for the church that does something like this. Thank you for the pastor, all who serve here. Well, I just thank you so much for First United Methodist. God bless the church. Lord, I'm, 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 I'm addressing this now. You know it to every individual in this room. We're either going or we're not. We're either saved or we're not. There's not another way to get to heaven than Jesus. 
So if we're counting on another way, it won't work. So I'm praying, Lord, as we examine our hearts now, each one of us, and we ask ourselves the question, that guy up there at the front, he died on the way to church. If I were to die on the way home from church tonight, would I go to heaven? And I should. Are you? The Bible says you can know what you're saying. God would not have it be ambiguous. He wouldn't have it be kind of iffy. He, he wants you to know in your heart of hearts that you can count on it and depend on it. If there's ever been a time in your life when you know you made that commitment, then you're ready. You just need to be about the business of helping other people get it. You can think of some people that you need to bring to church tomorrow night. As we talk about five things God does not know. Lord, I just pray that you'll put on our hearts people to bring tomorrow night. What a glorious crowd this is. More tonight than last night. This is just glory. So this is a God thing. Thank you, Lord. For us believers, uh, bring us into contact tomorrow with somebody at work or at school or at the store or we neighbors that we, we know and we care about and, and we can lean over the fence and say, like Miss Norris did, well, I'll, I'll pick you. I'll pick you up. Bring them to our hearts and minds. And Lord, for those of us who may be needing a new normal, we are sick and tired of being sick and tired. We're not praying the right side. We will turn the page. We may have been beaten up, but we don't have to be beaten. You can use our pain and turn it into a purpose. You can use our tragedy and turn it into a triumph. And I pray, Lord, that you would. Lord, for those who are unsure of their eternal destiny, I'm praying right now, in this holy moment, you will speak to them. Help them to say, I do see. That's you. Praying in your own words. Just pray for them. Because this is all you need to do to make that reservation. Just, just follow me. Just pray in your own words. And mean it. Ask the Jesus. It has to be sincere. You have to believe this. Pray believing. Dear Lord, I, I believe in you. Jesus, I know you are the Son of God. And I know now that you died on the cross for me and my sins. Because I am a sinner. And, and I've disobeyed you. And I've done stuff I ought not to have done. And I didn't do some things I should have done. And I'm, I'm not just sorry for it. I want to change. I want to turn from the way I live. And I want to start living for you. And after all, you made me have a life like that. So I want to, by your grace, by your power, help me do it. I ask you to save me. So forgive me. I repent. Lord, I, I need a guide now. I need, a, I need you to be my Lord. I need you to show me the way to go from this day forward. I want to live for you. And it may be three steps forward and two steps back, but I want to live for you from now on. I want to follow you. Shine the light on my path. I want to be faithful until you call me home someday, whenever that is. Tonight or a thousand times. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The Bible says, just like that 95 year old woman, if you say that and believe it, they're singing your name right now. You may live for decades here on earth, but when the time comes, you'll know where you're going. The Bible also says if we make a decision like that, we ought not to keep it a secret. We would want to share it. If a 95-year-old woman can roll her wheelchair down the aisle, we can come up to the front and share it. We're not going to ask anybody to say anything. They should share it with a counselor up here, a pastor up here. So we'll know how to pray for you from now on. You go back to your seat. Maybe somebody needs to come up and kneel down and again pray for lost loved ones, people who are not ready. Somebody needs to be normal. Just come and share that with the council. They can do that too. Whatever you're asking us to do, help us to have the courage when we stand in the moment just to leave our seats and come here to the front and share our decisions with these people who are people in confidence. And they'll know that we've been in the house of the Lord. And a great decision was made. 
thank you for what you are going to do by the power of the Holy Spirit. Bless you. Bless us and show us what you have for us. Jesus. Let's stand together, if you would, please.